Uh, so yes, uh, my name is LP. Uh, I'm here today to share my passion about multimodal. And the presentation today changed slightly the title to something that's closer to our current research towards real world multimodal AI. And, um, and we are in a world, uh, we were always in a world that is multimodal. That, that is true. I mean, we've been interacting, communicated, uh, communicating for ages, but now we see technologies uh, building on this idea of communication through multiple modalities. And in the last year with the pandemic, this has been even more uh, ab, uh, even more present. Um, we are doing it today with video conferencing. So now we have all these possibilities of uh, these technology that can, can proceed through different modalities. And, and in the case of communication, there's at least three of uh, these modalities that are extremely important during communication. I sometimes call it the three V of communication verbal, vocal, and visual, what you say, like the word you say, how you phrase your sentences, and at the same time, the intent you had behind these words. Another aspect very important is this prosody, this intonation, this quality that may be the tenseness or the breathiness of the voice, but also all of these pause fillers and laughter and what's called vocal expression. Another V, very important, is the gesture. It could be the B gesture that you have, or also the body language, uh, proxymix, which is something we sometimes lose in these 2D uh, video conference interaction. And if you ask me, one of the first cue I look at when looking at interaction is also eye gaze and eye contact and eye gestures. Um, they show an aspect of communication, of contact, but also look at cognitive loads through that. And definitely on the visual aspect, there's facial expression, uh, not just the basic facial expressions, happy, sad, surprise, but also looking at other, um, so that uh, uh, confusion or engagement. So when I use the term multimodal AI, I mean this idea of studying multiple heterogeneous modalities with the goal of inferring something about it, maybe on the medical side, looking at disorders or looking at the social signals or the emotions. If you ask me what is the most generic definition of multimodal, if you think of multimodal uh, at its more core, it's the science of heterogeneous data. Now today I will talk about a subset of it, which is multimodal AI, which bring the human centric aspects where the modalities are human inspired and also the skills like perception and generation and inference also inspired by human. That's where the AI comes in. And when you address such a hard problem like multimodal AI, um, you have to ask yourself, what are the core technical challenges for this? Are they some challenges in multimodal AI that have maybe been understudied in a more conventional machine learning? And so over many years, we studied this uh, and we eventually try to create a first draft of what would be the core technical challenges in multimodal AI. We identified five of them. I invite you, if you want the details, to look at the uh, journal paper on this, but more if you can't, uh, can't have enough of multimodal AI. There's 15 hours of a graduate level course. It's a 10th edition of that course that is now available on YouTube on this topic. So today I wanted to share at least about three of them, representation, alignment, and translation. But I want to put this also in the context of the real world application, because now technologies, this multimodal AI is no more just theories, 
it is getting closer and closer to practice. And when you get closer to practice, you have to ask yourself, are they new technical challenges when you bring this technology to a doctor, maybe as a decision support tool, or if you want to be able to help in businesses to better collaboration or leadership, or you want to, uh, in the case of pandemic, do even like online learning education. And yes, there are technical challenges that arise from being a real world uh, technologies. One of them is robustness. In the real world, you often have missing data or maybe even a full modality is missing or you have noise over your uh, inputs. One extremely important aspect is trust. That people who are using these technologies how can they trust this? What can we do to help with this? One aspect may be interpretability, meaning, or explainability, meaning that you have the AI being able to know what is happening in intermediate steps. That's one small step in that direction. Another important challenge is variability. If you are to interact with human, they are all quite different. We have idiosyncrasy in our behaviors and you wanna bring a technology that can uh, interact with a very broad range of people. And so, and one aspect of it is also to be fair. And fair means here could be also looking at biases, potential biases. And if you know there's a biases of being able to quantify them at the minimum, to know them and hopefully being able to remove them or debias or reduce. And as we get these technology outside in the world, we have to be aware because multimodal in to include a lot of private information. So today I will focus primarily on the first three core challenges and also relate them into these real world challenge. If we have time, I will also love to give more details on the other one but we'll focus first on these. And so as a first one, if you ask me, what is the core technical challenges in multimodal, which this one shares with many other fields, um, is the challenge of representation. How do you learn to represent and summarize multimodal heterogeneous data in a way that exploit this complementary and redundancy? And a very popular approach for that is called joint representation, where you bring this information about the language, about the gestures, about the vocal, and bring it together in a joint space with the goal of this being a summary of these three modalities, if you have three of them. And this is work, it's really exciting because this work on multimodal started more than 20 plus years ago, but about nine years ago, or about now we can say 10 years ago, there is a renewal of multimodal with uh, uh, bringing all of this interesting technology of, uh, uh, about neural representation. And that was really nice. And the early work in multimodal were in fact generative version of them like deep belief network. But very quickly, there was an extension of this work on, on so those feed forward networks like auto encoder. Uh, these uh, had some efficiency, their optimization often were more robust. And so the simple aspect here is that given your uh, initial unimodal representation, being able to learn that joint representation but that joint representation should still be have enough information to be able to recreate uh, the original representation from each modality. That's the concept of a multimodal autoencoder. But if you ask me what is currently the most popular approach by a large margin is more of a direct supervision where the joint representation is learned for a specific task. We see also, and I didn't discuss today because of time, but there's a lot of interest also in self-supervised learning. I will be happy to discuss that uh, separate topic, but there, I will say even though self-supervised learning is uh, gaining uh, a lot of popularity, still right now, when we think of joint representation and multimodal, we see a lot of them as direct supervision. 
But direct supervision and these joint representation come at a price where suddenly you bring kind of almost smush all of this information together. And so let's revisit multimodal. What does it mean to have those cross-modal interaction? It means that each modality has its own dynamic. Like language has syntax in it. It has its own uh, information about semantic. Visual has its own dynamic. The video has a smooth transition often. Vocal bring that subtlety. That's unimodal interaction. Bimodal interaction looks at between two modalities. We sometimes think that, oh, we should always right away put everything together. But no, there's often things that are bimodal by nature. Me emphasizing something, maybe primarily language and vocal. Or in my case, it is true, it is a lot of trimodal. So you have also trimodal interaction. So when you look at multimodal, don't all think everything is trimodal. Some aspects, sometimes you use only one modality to express your emotion. So when you build a representation, you need to integrate that unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal. And one simple but very efficient way is this idea of building tensors. A tensor will be a representation of these um, unimodal uh, representation in such a way that you keep the unimodal dynamic, but at the same time bring the other type of interaction. In this case, I start with only two modality where you have unimodal and bimodal. And the way of being able to create this with a simple product, you can bring these where you have, you just add this little one here where the, the trick here, if you don't add this, then you lose the unimodal. And by doing this little trick, you can also then get a trimodal tensor. The trimodal tensor has the unimodal in green, in light blue, the bimodal and the trimodal all in one big tensor. And although you may be thinking, oh, I'm increasing dimensionality, you should have to think two ways here. One is that these, each of these elements, each of these nodes of your tensor brings a possibility for your neural network to identify unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal. So in a sense, you're making it easier for the model. And if you're concerned about this extension and the fact that we expanded the number of dimensionality, you should know that these tensors, in fact, can be decomposed. And there's a nice way to be done so that at the end of the day, although mathematically the tensor is there, uh, you end up with a simpler uh, representation with a lower rank representation. And that allows you to be very efficient in your, um, in your representation. So this is uh, one example of multimodal representation that brings unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal. But as I mentioned, in many applications, you, uh, you have to be robust. And robust to be, could be to missing data or very noisy data. And let's start with this idea of missing data, where maybe because of problem with speech recognition or some problem with the microphone, you may have some issues, some words are mistranscribed, or maybe because of self-occlusion or some kind of occlusion, you just lose your signal for a little bit, or maybe even a full modality is completely lost and not there at test time. It was there at training time, but at test time, because of some issues, this is not there. So how do we handle these missing data? In statistics, there's been a lot of interesting work on amputation. This is definitely an area if you've not studied, you should look at. In the world of neural network, there's been interesting ways of trying to use these technology. I talk about autoencoder and there's these extension for variational autoencoder. Here, the idea is interesting. The idea would be, can I give as an input can I give as an input this noisy, maybe missing data to my encoder with the goal of getting this representation, ZM, my that representation, 
which will eventually could help me recreate my data and hopefully maybe even recreate the data without the missing data. So it's not a completely a two encoder, but it's more an encoder decoder, encoder taking the missing data and then outputting the, uh, the full data without the missing model, uh, information. Now, in theory, that looks interesting. So you have an encoder bring something, the ZM that is in theory should be a representation of all modalities, all information, even if some elements are missing and I can use that to regenerate. But is it really robust to different missing pattern? And here is the interesting intuition is that at the end of the day, this uh, different input, let's say I give different input to my encoder, I give this image to the encoder, or this image to the encoder, or this image to the encoder, all three images needs to all come to the same representation because they are different occlusions, but at the end of the day, I want my uh, representation to be the one of some, something that doesn't have any missing data. So I'm putting a lot of constraint on my encoder and this one encoder should be able to handle all these different missing patterns. That is a challenging thing. And as I will show empirically in experiment, this in fact, at the end of the day, doesn't, get, um, doesn't work well with only one encoder. So one of my students had this interesting idea, uh, looking at the extension of variational autoencoders and bring this to the idea of variational autodecoder. So the idea here, and it takes a little bit of time to understand, is now there's no more decoder, uh, sorry, no more encoders. And what will I do is give me an input uh, and I, my goal, I have this input and I want to encode it. And what will I do is I will start with a random version of it and I will iteratively optimize this representation and that decoder in such a way that I can fit my data. So even if the data is different, I, that doesn't matter because every time you give me data at inference, I will do this optimization. Now I lose a little bit on performance and I will be happy to talk about this issue because we have an extension, but the hope is that I get a lot into like robustness. And so to explain this and to show it visually, the idea is I get some missing data, I get an image and I have missing data. In this case, I will know which part of the image is missing. And I want to learn what is the representation of the data. But if I had all of the information, there was no missing data. I would like to know what is that representation. And the idea of the variational auto decoder is that at test time, I don't have just a one feed forward encoder. No, I will go through an optimization process, starting with a pure like noise and I will move along iteratively, optimizing the elbow, uh, optimizing it both for the representation and the decoder until I get this. And what is, so now you must ask yourself, how robust is this to missing pattern? And the key here is I want to be sure that even if I train with a different missing pattern, like Maybe in fact, it has like a test time, maybe I will vary from 10 to 90% of data and at training, I may have also 10 to 90%. So I hear at training, so maybe I train with really little noise and, but maybe I'm unlucky and at test time, I have in fact, a lot of noise. And so I ask myself, can I train with very unnoisy or little missing data and be able to train? And if you look at this variational auto encoder, like previous work, what you see is that they don't generalize. What it means is unless you're very lucky and you knew exactly the amount of noise or the amount of uh, missing uh, parts you will have, 
unless you're in that diagonal, these don't generalize. What's really nice with the VAD, because it doesn't have just one and quarter feet forward, and it will adapt to any input you give it, even if it is trained originally with little missing data, it still generalizes for all of this at test time. And I know you probably, some of you are like, oh, but what about GAN? I don't have time to go in, the, in detail about generative adversarial networks, but they are uh, any of the previous work or the latest previous work as is, is last year, they all have the same problem as the version of autoencoder. Unless you're really lucky and you know how much noise you'll have at test time, then your representation will not be as strong. So this is an example of real world and how we could uh, at least improve robustness. And this is looking at representation. There's a second technical challenge in multimodal, which is alignment. When I speak, maybe we're lucky and every gesture I make is synchronized, synchronized with my speech. But in most cases, these are, are loosely, weakly uh, aligned with each other. And so multimodal not only has this challenge of how to represent information and summarize it, but also elements from different modality like words and my gesture also needs to be aligned to each, to each other. I may be gesturing more at the end of the sentence or often or maybe at the beginning. So as was really well known by uh, McLean uh, work. Um, so yeah, so how do you align this information? And this problem has been nicely studied in dialogue for a long time. This challenge of grounding. There is different aspect of grounding. There's the common ground but here is the grounding also as the part of linking language to the world, to the perceived word in this case. As I talk, there are elements of my speech, of my spoken words, or if it's even written words, that will be linked to the environment. And one simplification of it is the idea of referring expression where I want to with my language refer to one specific object in the image. That's a simplification, but that allows us to understand how to ground and link object together. Could you bring me my pills? They should be on top of the nightstand on the left of the bed. Here I have at least two types of spatial grounding. One is an entity-based grounding where uh, usually noun phrases, Pills, my pills, or the nightstand, the bed, will be uh, often have a associated object entity in the world. Or at, so that is a, the first aspect of grounding. Another aspect, which in my mind is almost more interesting, is relationship. It's not just objects, but it's also relationship on top, on the left of the bed. All of these brings very interesting aspect. So when you do the grounding, is the grounding of the language with uh, the object and its relationship. And if you are to build an AI system that will help maybe elderly to uh, go and help them, you want to be sure that the system is really doing the action for the right reason. Because if, if it works 90% of the time and suddenly doesn't work, how do you know? And so what's the reason? So how can we trust that all these grounding elements about object, entity, and relationship are properly modeled? And one solution, it's not the only solution, but one aspect of the solution is interpretability. We should be able to see what are the internal states of this algorithm so that we can first, from a human perspective, confirm and also maybe improve or give more clarification to the algorithm. And as a step in this, is this is just one small step, but a very interesting step, is the idea of 
uh, using linguistic syntax as a building block for this grounding, because we have a lot of interesting theories about linguistic and we could take advantage of this. In a sentence like pills on top of the nightstand on the left of the bed, there is a, you can use syntax parsing to identify noun phrases. You can also look at the relationship between them. And so you can use this information and there, from there you can, you, what we want to get from it is an algorithm that should at the minimum start by identifying the noun phrases. Like for the example, which of the object is the bed, which of object is the nightstand and which object are possibly the pills. And there may be ambiguity at this stage. And that's important to keep this ambiguity and work with it. That's another aspect of trustworthiness. Is it, is it okay to be sometime wrong as long as you know you're wrong. So you need to model this ambiguity with you as you grow. The second aspect here is then suddenly you want to bring not just the object, but the entities with it. So on the left of the bed, on the left of the bed, there's a lot of object on the left of the bed. But here I'm talking about the nightstand on the left of the bed. So that reduces the possibilities. And then finally on top of it. So it's not just the nightstand, it's on top of the nightstand. And then finally you can get the pills that are uh, referred to. Now, how do we build this into a, a, a neural representation? One aspect to do that, to do this alignment between images and language um, is to, um, you wanna do it in such a way that you're gonna be able to represent this human inspired inference. And also you want to be sure that you use all elements of the sentence, like not just the target, the pills, but you also through your, uh, through your inference, you also took advantage of the support information. And so one way to do this is to look at it from a module network perspective, where you will have modules for locating unknown phrases, and then relating them and then intersecting this information, aggregating, like kind of summarizing, you could have called this. And so when you take this and compare this groundness, linguistically inspired approach with some of the state of the art at that point, one of the challenge is the state of the art still worked really well, but the problem it was working, it seems it was working for the wrong reason because it was not using any of the supporting object. When you look under the hood, you could have hidden the supporting object and it still didn't, uh, it still performed. So the problem is the supporting object were not used while GroundNet is good at doing it. If you ask me what is the next stage in grounding and alignment in this kind of work, it's not just aligning my language with the environment, but also aligning my language to the environment and the action I can do in the environment. I take an object. And so if you're interested like us on this topic, Refer360 is an example for that. So this is alignment. And now you're probably asking yourself, I can represent information. I align, I synchronize information, but can I do it together at the same time? Because in a lot of earlier work, uh, people will simply use these predefined window, hoping that most of the information is synchronous. But in reality, a word can have an impact that is very long range. We know it from linguistic, uh, when we have a referring, uh, when we have information with those long range dependency. And so we, this is one important aspect here is not just to learn representation, but learn representation that align as well. Probably by now you have heard of the term transformer. These self attention models are giving us a new tool to be able to contextualize. Because when I say a word like I like, or the word spectacle in this case, spectacle, I want to be able to contextualize spectacle. What is this word representation for spectacle that take into consideration 
the facial expression that happened at the same time and also the prosthetic cues that happened at the same time. And the intuition here with the self-attention is that I will have a query, my, my word spectacle, and I'm gonna look at all the possible images. That's one extreme version. I can talk a lot about the challenge of segmentation and granularity in multimodal cases, but I, let's discuss it. But for now, let's look at it and say, for all of these uh, images, let which of these keys match my query the most. What it means is that my transformer will learn a space where for relevant information to spectacle will have been embedded in a space, the, the key space, in such a way that they're close to each other. I can use the similarity at that point to identify which of the frame are useful for me and use that to then create a representation. This representation is all the visual information that is relevant to my word. And then the classic idea of residual connection. What is it in this visual that is not yet in spectacle? And then I add it. What I get at the end is a word representation that has been visually contextualized. This idea can be done for any kind of bimodal uh, interaction that gives you those contextualized representation. You can do it in multiple layers as much as you want. And if you are, for some reason, a believer in a joint representation, you can always squish that together. There's not required. You could also keep them separate. We will call this coordinated representation at that point. But this uh, bring the unimodal and bimodal. But I also would like to be able to encode not just unimodal, bimodal, but also trimodal in those transformers. And that's the intuition we got earlier. And that's for that is this cross-modal transformer. Um, this is the idea that you want to encode unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal. So if you have your language at time one, visual at time one, acoustic at time one, or like I call them verbal, visual, and, and vocal, this is the representation. And then you have it at time T, and if it's a sequence, and then you would like, what you want at the end is same length sequence, but everything has been contextualized with the others in a way that it keeps the possibility that sometimes things are unimodal and I don't want to lose that unimodal dynamic. Sometimes they're bimodal, I want to take advantage of that. And sometimes I do have trimodal. And so what I will do, I will take advantage of this idea of masking and I will create a version of my representation that is masked to only keep unimodal, then a version of it that is masked to keep the bimodal, and then another one for trimodal. And each of them will be passed to some self-attention. There, the self-attention at the top will be kind of your typical multimodal transformer, just only putting everything together. This, the bimodal will be closer to the transformer I talk about, although the one I talked about was a directional version of that. And then you will have just a unimodal transformer. At the end of the day, then you need to bring it back to a dimensionality so you can summarize this. And summarize brings that the trimodal, bimodal, and unimodal together. When you do this on a task, a very popular benchmark, task is multimodal sentiment analysis. Um, what's really interesting, this is early fusion. When you add the tensor, so unimodal, bimodal, and trimodal. And when you reduce the dimension, I call this a low rank version of the, uh, the tensor. And when you do alignment at the same time, then you get much closer to human performance. So this is representation alignment and the idea. Um, so the idea now is how do we go uh, to the next challenge? So it's not representation synchronization, but at the end of the day, you need to also do something with this. And so either you use this multimodal information to generate some other modalities or possibly do bring this to be able to predict something else. I will focus today on a subset of that, the translation. This is the last part of the talk. 
Um, but I'm also happy to talk about fusion in more detail uh, as well. Translation, you know a lot uh, maybe about image captioning, where you take an image and you want to translate it into another modality here, the language. To, so it's a generation going from image to language. I wanted to talk about a different topic just so that you have a little bit of diversity. And here in this case, it's the idea of uh, me uh, talking and suddenly, uh, let's say you lose the video and you're still hearing me, but you lost the video, but you heard me for about 30 minutes. So you have an idea of how LP talks. And so LP talks in a certain way and so you already created this model of LP. In fact, maybe I don't even need to turn on my video and an avatar will start and go. So that is the idea, uh, the idea behind speech to gesture. This is something that has been studied in the virtual human community for quite some time. This is just an example from our early work in, in this direction. Um, where you take what the person said, the language, and how they say this to bring and be able to generate the virtual uh, version of this. This can be important in many applications. One of them is privacy in mental health. Maybe someone uh, would like to get some help uh, with their possible mental uh, illness. But they don't, they, they, there's maybe a stigma, maybe stigma is related uh, to maybe being a, in an environment like being a veteran. And, and so you, for some reason, have a stigma, oh, I, I should not go and seek help. What if I could help with you by creating a virtual avatar of you to help with this privacy? Modeling this is also useful about understanding gesture in general, to be understanding how people gesture and be able to better understand uh, these nonverbal behavior. And there is a lot of variability. <laughs> Probably there's, I don't know how many people in this call, each of you have their own intrinsic uh, personal way of behaving. Some people may be behaving part in the study because they were busy having the time of their lives. <laughs> So you deliver a joke, but no motion in this case, very, oh, like person maybe closer to me. It also doesn't change much of what they went into change. Where someone does a lot more be gesture. Everybody has their own style. And so there is a dream there to be able to learn a gesture space where people's uh, behavior can be quantified and this idiosyncrasy can be kept and this viability can be modeled so that you have different people. And when, if you get this information about gestures, maybe you can go and use this to take a source a style and then apply it to another person. This is, you should see it as more as a way of testing that your gesture space really learn the idiosyncrasy. For example, let me hear this first speaker. And actually this here is as as you could have guessed that. So a speaker here, very different tile. I mean, this person is drawing uh, at a certain tempo. Um, and then use it for some other style. And here with the speaker, what we will do is use only the audio of that speaker and then use the gesture style to generate a new set of gesture for that audio. And it's not just the number of companies, it's the variety. You've got fast cash, cash central, speedy. And this is possible. I mean, someone is enumerating team they could do it this way or they could draw them. So these are all different style. And so you should be able uh, to learn this. And so at the end of the day, you wanna learn a gesture space. So, and you should ask yourself, what does this space represent? How do we use this space to generate a style gesture? And how do we learn this space? And so, each color in this gesture space is a region. Here we did one with eight speaker. And, and so in the scope of word, the data for each speaker was available during training, but then at test time, you will really be able to generalize. And so what you want is from this space of different people, you wanna be able to use this information 
and at test time use for a specific speaker, but a brand new audio, learn this and be able to animate this new uh, set of behavior. And this could be, uh, you have a dictionary of possible styles. At the end of the day, uh, what I believe is that you get this portfolio. And another very interesting thing for future work is to look at commonalities within that space as well. And you must ask yourself, how do you learn and train this, gen the, this gesture space? And one approach is to inspire the little bit from a generative adversarial network is the idea that the generated, um, the generated output uh, the generated output here should be really close, as close as possible in its style to the original person doing that same audio. And so that is one interesting way. But you, if you remember, if I just do a generative adversarial network here, I may not be able to model all the different idiosyncrasy. If I'm not careful, I may in fact end up with just one style to be sure that this doesn't happen, we will extend the idea here to have a conditional mixed GAN where you have multiple generator, you kind of have a mixture of experts and that becomes a nice parameters. And these mixture of experts will be used and adapt, ad, uh, dynamically adapted. So dynamically you will find which mixture of these generators are best applicable for this uh, person. And that's really interesting <coughs> because what is uh, nice is that the maybe in the middle, I'm acting a lot like person A, but then I become a lot more like person B. And so at that point, I should be able to dynamically change the style. Okay, very interesting. And so you have this generated and to be sure that it looks way, uh, real, we'll add on top the discriminator. So this is an example of being able to model in the case of real world application, try to model more of the variability in, in people's behaviors. And just one last example where you go ahead. He said, the Pope said, the one regret he had is that he didn't go to the Statue of Liberty because it would be nice to be able to say that at least once in his life, he spent some time. And then you can use this. We have this opportunity to observe a clean nucleosynthesis process of this R process. We sometimes abbreviate it rapid with R, so R process. R process. So then and the person is no more uh, drawing what? and use the style of the other person. So I talk about representation and the robustness of it. We talk about alignment and it's looking forward to trust, trustworthy technologies and translation and looking at the variability. Uh, fusion is an important aspect where the modality comes together to predict. And there is also the challenge of co-learning when one modality helps the other. And as I emphasize today, is that the, uh, the challenges here are not just about the core technical challenges of multimodal, but we also need to look at how they are in the real world the robustness of it to missing data, looking at the variability and the idiosyncrasy and the trustworthiness. And I wanna give one more example quickly on the trustworthiness because a lot of time we think about AI and force the AI to always make a prediction, but I believe in AI who is able to tell you, I will prefer to abstain. I will prefer, I don't know. I, I just don't know. This is too much noise. This is too much. I just don't know. And that's great. I much prefer an AI system like this, a system that if it doesn't know, just tell you. Now, if they tell me I don't know all the time, that will be a problem. And so you need to trade up. And one approach uh, from earlier work that we did was the idea of uh, using the intuition of horse race gambling, where here the idea is the balance between betting for one of the label. So I'm betting, so I, I'm betting on one of the horse or I always have the option to abstain myself. But if I abstain myself too much, I'm not gonna get any money or any win. And so you need that trade-off. This is the example of trustworthy, the, an example of fairness. And I think it's really important. 
um, is the idea of being able to eventually quantify fairness and quantify possible biases. Most data sets have biases, so you should not be surprised that they have biases. The first step is to be able to quantify these biases. It could be gender related. And there's a lot of really useful and interesting work in language-based debiasing. But one question for you, how do we debias multimodal representation? Ask yourself that. We're asking ourselves, but I'm happy to discuss. And the last point is privacy. I build all this technology and now these days, when we think multimodal, we may think of mobile data. And I want to be able to look at this mobile data and be able to infer something maybe like mood that could be helpful to predict, uh, to help as a decision support tool um, for people in treatment, maybe treatment, depression, psychosis. And so you ask yourself, if I was to look at this information, I predict mood from my mobile data. If you look closely, when you plot this information, each of these colors here are in fact a different person. So at the end of the day, I was hoping to get moved, but I really got people. That's the prediction. So there are approaches to be done. And one example is the selective additive learning where you're gonna selectively add noise on your representation in such a way that you get a representation that do not identify the person. So this is what I want to talk today about, the important core challenge of multimodal and its real world challenges as well. Happy to discuss more to the questions you have. Merci pour votre attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>